Welcome back again, eighth grade. We are going to be reading from the novel Farewell to Manzanar by Jean Wakasuki Houston and James D. Houston. Today we are reading chapter 19. We have a few study guide questions to go along with us today, and I think it's one more than what we had yesterday. So yesterday we had three, today we have four. So chapter 19, uh, the first question is, how long did the Wakasuki family live in Manzanar? Question two, Jean and her family feared that they would be the victims of violence when they returned to California. What happened to them when they arrived? Three, where did the family settle? Meaning where did they end up living? Where did they stay put? And four, explain the complicated flip in gender roles that mama and papa experienced. So first we'll talk about gender roles for just a minute especially in the time of the 1940s. The male was the man of the house. He was the one to go out and get a job. He was the one to bring home the money and to provide for the family. And the woman's job was to stay home and take care of the family, to cook the meals and take care of the children, etc. So if there's a, a flip in those gender roles, then we're probably going to see the opposite of that between mama and papa. And why is that complicated in this, the sense of this book? Okay, so we are on page 149. Please get out your book and read along with me. Re-entry. A few days before we left Manzanar, Papa decided that since we had to go, we might as well leave in style. And by our own volition, meaning they're gonna make the decision to go instead of being forced. He broke free of the lethargy that had nailed him to our steps for months. He grabbed his Bismarck walking stick and took off, almost at a run, heading for Lone Pine by him, to buy himself a car. Mama tried to talk him out of this. Traveling by bus made much more sense, she said. It was faster, and we'd be there in a day. He snorted with disdain at her advice. Before the war, he had always preferred offbeat, unpredictable cars that no one else of his acquaintance would be likely to own. For a couple of years, he drove a long six-cylinder Chrysler that got about 10 miles to the gallon. In the early 30s, he drove a Terraplane. Late that afternoon, he came back from Lone Pine in a midnight blue Nash sedan, fondling the short, stubby gear shift that projected from its dashboard. The gear shift was what attracted him. And it was one of the few parts of that car to reach Southern California unscathed. To get all nine of us, plus our clothes and the odds and ends of furniture we'd accumulated from Owens Valley, 225 miles south of Long Beach, Papa had to make the trip three times. He pushed the car so hard, it broke down about every 100 miles or so. In all, it took four days. I went in the, lo the first load with Mama and May in a back seat heaped to the ceiling with dishes and lamps and bedding. A double mattress was tied to the roof. We could have been an oaky family heading west, while Papa in his wide-brimmed hat and his turtleneck sweater drove like a wild man, as if he couldn't wait to get back to civilization. I didn't understand this. After all the stories we'd heard, each time the car collapsed, I prayed we might be stranded there indefinitely. But he could leap out, cursing, and bully it into motion again, fix the tire, replace the fan belt, kick the radiator, whatever was required. I still see him standing by that desert road in the hot shade of the great saguaro cactus, the blue hood open as he shouts at the engine in Japanese, damning it and damning the man who sold him his, this car. He slams the hood shut in disgust, ready to attack it with the butt end of his cane. And that slam, as if by insult, somehow starts the car. So that Papa has to jump in and grab the steering wheel and that dashboard gear knob before the Nash drives away without him. When he came back from Lone Pine, he was drunk on the first real whiskey he had tasted in years. He was drinking all the way past Mojave and into the northern suburbs of Los Angeles. There, he suddenly sobered up. 
and his mood began to match what mine had been since we drove out the main gate, as if what we had all been dreading so long was finally to appear. At any moment, without warning, a burst of machine gun fire or a row of Burma shave signs saying, Japs, go back where you came from. The stories, the murmurs, the headlines of the last few months had imprinted in my mind the word hate. I had heard my sister, sister say, why do they hate us? I had heard mama say with lonesome resignation, I don't understand all this hate in the world. It was a bleak and awful sounding word, yet I had no idea at all what shape it might take if ever I confronted it. I saw it as a dark amorphous cloud that would descend from above and enclose us forever. As we entered Los Angeles, I sat huddled in the back seat, silent, fearing any word I uttered might bring it to life. But there was no sign of it anywhere. In fact, no response to us at all as we drove down the palm-lined boulevards, past the busy rows of shops and markets, the lawns and driveways of quiet residential streets. Leaving in 1942, no one had any idea what to expect, since no one knew what awaited us. We had been underprepared, and that just deepened the shock of what we found. Now, the situation was reversed. In our isolated world, we had overprepared for shows of abuse. If anything, what greeted us now was indifference. Indeed, if the movements of the city were an indication, the very existence of Manzanar and all it had stood for might be in doubt. The land we drove away from three and a half years earlier had not altered a bit. Here we were, like fleeing refugees, trekking in some from some ruined zone of war. And yet, on our six hour drive south, we seem to have passed through a time machine, as if in March of 1942, one had lifted his foot to take a step, had set it down in October of 1945, and was expected just to keep on walking, with all intervening time erased. In the months to come, because one did have to keep on walking, one desperately wanted to believe nothing had changed during those years of suspended animation. But of course, as soon as we soon discovered, everything had. Our most immediate problem was where to live. What Papa had read in the papers was true. Housing was short and getting shorter. During 1944, over a million people had moved into California from the South and Midwest. But due to wartime priorities, very little new housing had been developed. Now, 60,000 Japanese Americans were returning to their former communities on the West Coast and being put into trailer camps. Quonset huts, back rooms of private homes, church social halls, anywhere they could fit. We were luckier than many. The American Friends Service, sorry. <laughs> Trying to get comfortable. <laughs> the American Friends Service, the same people who had helped us after the eviction from Terminal Island, helped us rent and move into an apartment in Cabrillo Homes, a housing project in West Long Beach, built by the government for shipyard and defense plant workers. At the time, it seemed to be a big step up in the world. There would be no more standing in chow lines. Now mama had a stove to cook on. We had three bedrooms and we had an inside toilet. As soon as the front door was closed, Papa went in and flushed it. And when it worked, we hooted with delight. I didn't really see Cabrillo Homes for what it was until I started high school a few years later. It looked like a half finished and under maintained army base. Long two story stucco buildings were set in rows like barracks. Peeling two by four banisters guided you up the outside stairways. Community clotheslines ran above the ragged strips of grass. Mama picked up the kitchenware and some silverware she had stored with neighbors in Boyle Heights. But the warehouse where she'd stored the rest had been unaccountably robbed of furniture, appliances, and most of those silver anniversary gifts. Papa already knew the car he'd put money on before Pearl Harbor 
had been repossessed. And as he suspected, no record of his fishing boats remained. This put him right back where he'd been in 1904, arriving in a new land and starting over from economic zero. It was another snip of the castrator's scissors and he never really recovered from this, implying that they're taking his manhood again, either financially or spiritually. Yet neither did he entirely give up. One of the amazing things about America is the way it can both undermine you and keep you believing in your own possibilities, pumping you with hope. To maintain some hold on his self, his self-esteem, Papa began to pursue his doomed plan for setting up a housing cooperative among the returning Japanese. In our small front room, he built a drafting table and worked on sketches for what would become the thick pile of blueprints he carried to households and civic offices all over Los Angeles County looking for support. Mama's first concern, meanwhile, as always, was how to keep the money coming in. She had saved about $500, but that wouldn't last long. Soon after we settled in Cabrillo Homes, the Friends Service found some openings at one of the fish canneries. And she went back to the kind of job she'd had when we lived on Terminal Island. It meant much more to her now than it had before the war. In 1941, after Papa disappeared, she was marking time while we drifted, awaiting the inevitable. Now, she knew the household income was going to be her responsibility for quite a while. This starts to get into that gender flip is why it's complicated. What was she like before the war and what, I mean, she worked before the war, not before they went into Manzanar, um, to now. So why is this, this change here, okay? She knew the household income was going to be her responsibility for quite a while. Papa would never accept anything like a cannery job. And if he did, Mama's shame would be even greater than his. This would be a sure sign that we had hit rock bottom. So she went to work with as much pride as she could muster. Early each morning, she would make up her face, she would fix her hair, cover it with a flimsy net, put on a clean white cannery worker's dress, and stick a brightly colored handkerchief in the la la lapel pocket. The carpool horn would honk and she would rush out to join four other Japanese women who had fixed their hair that morning, applied the vanishing cream, and sported freshly ironed hankies. So it's okay for the women to go do those jobs, but uh, that job would be beneath him. As for me, the shapeless dread of that great dark cloud in my imagination gradually receded, soothed away by a sky the same blue it had always been, lawns the same green, traffic signals that still changed with dependable regularity, and familiar radio programs to fill up the late afternoons and evenings. Jack Armstrong, Captain Midnight, The Whistler, I Love a Mystery. That dread was gone. But those premonitions proved correct. Premonitions meaning the, what they believed they were going to see come into, that hatred that they were preparing themselves for that didn't seem to be there. Sounds like they're going to be correct later on. In a way, I hadn't been at all prepared for on the first day back in public school, when the shape of what I truly had to deal with appeared to me for the first time. And we'll read about that later on in the, the, the book as we, she talks about going to school after being released from Manzanar. So the one question that I didn't really pause on was where they finally settled, but if you take a look back to page 153, um, it does share with you how the, um, the American Friends Service helped them to, to settle. Um, they're in the Cabrillo Homes in West Long Beach is where they ended up settling. Um, so if you're looking for that answer, that is on page 153. And I think we pretty clearly covered the other questions. Let's just peek back. How long did the Wakasuki family live in Manzanar? Did it really tell us that right at the beginning? So we might have to do some math on this one. Does it tell us when they left? 
All right, give me one second. I'm gonna. So I paused that for just a second because I needed a minute to look for where the answer was. I knew that we covered it, but I didn't know how quickly I would come across that. So I hopefully you will take some time to flip through, but it is pretty clear within the book, um, within this chapter that we just read. Um, so if we turn to page 152, you can, it actually tells you right in there when they came to Manzanar, March of 1942, and then when did they leave? October of 1945. So if you do the math on that, how many years? We're looking at about three and a half years. Um, so make sure that you have all of that in there, and hopefully if I you know, watching the videos, I'm helping you out here a little bit to figure those answers out. Um, if you have any questions, if you're struggling with the, the gender flip question or anything like that, please make sure that you reach out. Um, I'm more than willing to, to help you figure out what the answer might be. And I hope you have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 20.